The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Timing is everything. That's true in many areas of our lives, isn't it? Have you ever seen a public marriage proposal take place? Perhaps even been involved in one? You know, you, you, you watch a football game or something and the guy propo- proposes in front of everyone, a huge crowd of people. It's even shown on TV. If you're going to do something like that publicly, you'd better wait until you're certain what the answer is going to be. Several years back, there was a Houston Rockets basketball game, and at the game, a, a guy got down on one knee, right out, out on the court, right at halftime, and proposed to his girlfriend in front of the crowd. And while they were showing this, the TV announcers were joking around. One of them, one of them said, you know, I wonder if, if anyone would ever say no in a proposal like that. And then she did. She ran off the court and left him there kneeling while the announcer tried to blather on about how he was just joking. He didn't know that was going to happen. When and how a man proposes matters. Timing is everything. If he does it too soon or even perhaps in the wrong way, he might ruin a relationship that could have led to a marriage. Timing. Timing is everything. And tonight's example of irony is all about timing. It can be summed up in one simple statement on which the religious leaders of Israel agreed. A statement of when they wanted to kill Jesus, or rather when they wanted to make sure they did not kill Jesus. Not during the feast. We consider the words of the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 26, beginning at the first verse, and let's rise as we hear these words of the Gospel. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Here ends the Holy Gospel, and we pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father, and they are the truth. Sanctify us by the truth. Amen. You may be seated. not during the feast. And the feast, of course, refers to the Passover celebration. It was the most important festival of the year for the Jewish people. And it was followed by a week-long celebration known as the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Now, during the Passover, Jewish pilgrims flooded Jerusalem. They came from all over to be at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover there in that holy city. The events of our text occurred just two days before the Passover, Tuesday of Holy Week, the week our Savior was crucified. And these pilgrims, these Jewish visitors, were already streaming into the city. One could feel the holiday excitement in the air. And Jesus' most committed enemies came to an agreement that week, not during the feast. That was the one time they did not want to kill Jesus. Matthew sets up this irony for us so well that it's almost overstatement to point it out. On that Tuesday, two groups of people were meeting. On the Mount of Olives, we see Jesus sitting down with his disciples. And over in the palace of Caiaphas, the high priests, the chief priests, and the elders of the people were meeting together. And what were these Jewish leaders doing? Matthew says they plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. These are the leaders of the Jewish nation. The men charged with both justice as well as religious purity. And these men hated Jesus so much they were plotting to kill him. And they wanted to do it in some sly, some secret way, some treacherous way. They wanted to make sure they wouldn't be blamed for it. How's that for irony? These religious leaders wanted to find some sneaky way to kill Jesus. 
And they reached consensus on that important issue, not during the feast. <clears throat> the Bible doesn't tell us who of them spoke these words, and it really doesn't matter. They all agreed, they all recognized that this was wise advice. It would be so much easier for them to deal with Jesus after the Passover was over. The crowds would all go home. Jerusalem would become again a relatively sleepy provincial capital. They could do whatever they wanted to Jesus then without causing so much of an uproar. But not during the festival, no. That was the one time they did not want to kill Jesus. And what a contrast between that meeting of the religious leaders and the meeting of Jesus and his disciples. What was Jesus doing at the same time? Jesus and his disciples at that point had already had a full day. They had been to the temple. Jesus had confronted his enemies there and won every argument with them. Then Jesus and his disciples had walked out of the city to the Mount of Olives. And there Jesus taught them about his return. And then he spoke these crucial words. You know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. You see, it didn't matter what the chief priests and elders were plotting. Their plans didn't matter. Jesus' time had come. In two days, on the very day of the Passover, he would be arrested so that he could be crucified. So at the one time that his enemies did not want to do it, that's when they would end up killing him. And it wouldn't be done in some stealthy, sneaky manner. There would be no secret about it. There would be nothing sly about it. Jesus wasn't going to be stabbed in the back by an assassin. He wasn't just going to disappear and never be heard from again. He was going to be crucified. And by definition, crucifixion was a very public act. First of all, it had to be carried out by the Romans because the Jewish leadership had no authority to carry out executions. Only the Roman government could do that. That would require a whole legal proceeding in advance. And then crucifixion, the crucifixion itself, would involve nailing the victim to a post and letting him hang, sometimes for days. It wasn't a quick process. He would hang there until he died. And so it took an open space as well. And then guards had to watch over the prisoner until he died. In the city of Jerusalem, it meant that one would have to march the prisoner through the city, out of the city, to the mount called Calvary, where executions traditionally took place. Nothing would be quiet or secret about a crucifixion by any means. Nothing about Jesus' death was what the Jewish leaders expected or wanted. What lesson do we learn from this irony of Jesus' passion? Who was really in charge? The leaders of the Jews were convinced that they had matters under control. They could take care of this. Even though the Romans ruled the land, the Jews pretty much had Pontius Pilate wrapped around their collective little finger. They controlled the temple, and through that, they controlled the people. And they were convinced that they could make this happen the way they wanted it to happen. But God had other ideas. God himself had chosen the Passover to be the day when his son would be arrested and die. In fact, God had given them the Passover as a prophecy of Christ to point ahead to the coming Savior, God wanted Jerusalem to be filled with and overflowing with people on the day that his son died because God wanted the people to see this fulfillment of all that he had been promising them for 1,500 years. The entire ministry of Jesus really was aimed at and led up to that final trip to Jerusalem. So even though these religious leaders agreed, not during the feast... Still, it was they who paid Judas to betray Jesus. These very men were the ones who sent the temple guards to Gethsemane with Judas on the night of the Passover to arrest him. These men gathered those false witnesses in the middle of that night. They held their kangaroo court. They convicted Jesus of blasphemy. 
These men brought him to Pilate and demanded that he die. These men convinced the people to ask for the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus when Pilate wanted to let Jesus go. These men even walked back and forth in front of his cross, taunting him. And these men did all these things because God's plan could not be stopped. God's love demanded that he give himself to pay for all sins, even the sins of these men. And so at the time that these men least wanted to kill Jesus, God made them fulfill the plan he had conceived of before the world began. And God did all that for each and every one of us. He saw you and me before he ever said, let there be light. He controlled everything. He controlled all events so that it all happened exactly the way that he intended it to happen. He even used these men to bring Jesus' mission to completion so that we would have life. Despite their own plans and intentions, the Jewish leaders played into God's hands. Now obviously, when God decides that he's going to make something happen, it happens. But how we become his tools matters. Do we serve God out of faith or in spite of our unbelief? What made these men serve God's plan? They didn't want to serve God's plan, but it was their own sinful pride that still led them to do what God had intended to be done. We see that in the rationale for their decision. Not during the feast. It was the one time that what they feared most would actually happen. What was it that they feared most? Well, they were afraid of losing their position. That's why they hated Jesus to begin with. He was too popular. From the very beginning, they were worried that he was undercutting their position of authority with the people. That same fear drove the decision to wait till all the people were out of Jerusalem. Because of all those visitors who were filling Jerusalem, they said not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. They didn't want a riot. Riots are destructive. People get hurt, even killed. Buildings get burned down. Property gets looted. But that's not what these men were worried about. They ruled Israel because the Romans let them rule Israel. The Romans figured that as long as these guys collected the taxes and kept the people in line... It was cheaper and easier to let them take care of local matters on their own. But if they couldn't handle the job, then the Romans would find someone else to do it. So that was the Jewish leader's biggest fear. They liked being in charge and didn't want to lose the authority they had. And so their sinful pride drove them to plot murder. Now obviously you and I don't share their hatred of the Savior, But even so, can we honestly claim to be any better than those men? Because we see that their problem is our problem too. Sinful pride is what led them to kill Jesus. And sinful pride is at the heart of all our sin as well. It takes many forms, but in the end, sinful pride says, I'm the most important person on earth. What I want should matter more than what anyone else wants, even more than what God wants. Now, I'm certain none of us here would express it in those words, but isn't that the way we act sometimes? When we throw temper tantrums, and I think we all know adults can throw pretty good temper tantrums, isn't that the same thing? When we hold grudges even, when we replay in our minds that horrible thing that so-and-so did to us or said about us, isn't that sinful pride as well? Or, even when we wallow in despair, when we convince ourselves that our sins are so bad, God could never forgive us and love us. That's sinful pride too. If we think that we are so powerful that we can sin so much that Jesus can't pay for our sin, that's sinful pride. Saying that Jesus did not do enough on the cross to cover my sin. God calls us to be humble to put him first, and to serve him and to serve our neighbor. 
God calls us to sacrifice for our spouses and our children, even for strangers who still need to hear the gospel. God calls us to be pure in heart and pure in mind, as well as in word and action. Sinful pride will always find a reason to rebel against God. And even if we actually succeed in hiding our pride from every other human being, God still sees it. The sinful pride in our hearts and that displays itself in our lives earns death. It earns hell for us. That's what every single one of us deserves. And God knows that. That's why God made sure that his son died on the very day these men did not want him to die. Jesus was dying for us. And it was no accident that he died on a cross. The Romans had plenty of other ways of executing criminals. They reserved crucifixion, in fact, only for traitors and rebels. Now certainly part of it was the horrible pain involved. And we might tend to think about the pain involved in crucifixion. But you know what? The Bible never dwells on the physical pain of the cross. Instead, the Bible focuses more on the shame of dying on a cross. You see, to the Romans, the cross proclaimed that a person was the lowest kind of criminal, that the person was unworthy of any kind of honor in death. And to the Jewish people, the cross was even worse. God had said in Deuteronomy, a hanged man is cursed by God. And when God says cursed, he doesn't mean something like the evil eye or casting spells or anything like that. God's curse is when God damns someone to hell, when someone is cut off from God's goodness entirely. So to the Jews, being hung on the cross symbolized being abandoned to hell. And so Jesus said to his disciples that he would be crucified. He would be abandoned to the suffering of hell itself on that cross. His Father would serve up to Him all the shame and scorn that we sinners should get from a holy God because we dared to trot our sinful pride and follow it instead of Him. God had every right to pour that shame and scorn on us in hell, but He won't do that. And He won't do that because Jesus didn't suffer just for one man's scorn and shame in hell. On the cross, Jesus suffered for all scorn, all the shame and all the hell of every sinner who will ever live. And then he died for us all. And then he rose from the grave. And when he rose, he said that all the scorn, all the shame, all the death and hell coming to us was over and gone and taken away. We are free. We are loved. And we will live with him forever. Yes, timing is everything. These men wanted to kill Jesus, most certainly, but just not that particular week. And when it didn't go the way they planned, they still celebrated getting rid of him. They probably even counted themselves lucky that a riot did not break out. Irony. Irony is a set of circumstances or an outcome that's opposite of what one might expect. And they might have seen irony in the foolishness of their fears when things turned out just fine for them, or so it seemed at first. But that's not the real irony here. The real irony is that God used the hatred and the opposition of these men to bring our Savior to the cross at exactly the moment He had planned so that Jesus could fulfill His mission, so that Jesus could win eternal life for us. And so we give thanks to God for that irony. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>